here with Greg Littleye, who's the Chief Medical Information Officer at PRA Health Sciences. Thanks for joining today, Greg. Thank you. Um, now, obviously, COVID-19 has uh, changed healthcare and drug development uh, hugely in the last year. Do you think these changes are temporary or permanent? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I think a lot of people are saying that 2020 was the year that everything changed in healthcare for a number of different reasons. Uh, uh, in we've we've had a devastating public health crisis that has affected both the United States and the globe. The United States has been disproportionately affected. We've had 25% of the cases and 19% of the deaths, despite the fact that we have somewhere about you know four or five percent of the population. Um, uh, and economically, it's been it, the consequences have been devastating. You know that's partly outside the scope of this discussion, but but clearly there's been there's been you know many many you know negative consequences to you know tourism and travel, etc. On the other hand, um, there has been a dramatic positive response by uh, the healthcare industry. Uh, the drug development in industry, regulators from a global basis. So, so uh, uh, certainly not saying that everything has turned out, you know, it's turning turning out peachy, but uh, there has been. Uh, I think we can be heartened by the fact that that uh, nations have come together, uh, regulators have come together uh, across the globe, and and the industry defined as uh, pharmaceutical, drug development, biotech, and healthcare have come together to to respond. Uh, to this for for some uh, truly impressive mm -hmm. developments. Uh, and and I think the nature of the question here is how much of this is temporary and how much of this is a permanent change. Mm -hmm. And without being too glib about it, I think the answer is both. There are some things that have temporarily changed, but there's a number of things that are permanently changing. And and I'm I'm optimistic that many of the changes are are indeed for the better, uh, and and happy to discuss some of those in in a bit more detail. Yeah. So should we look at them a little bit more? Um, what are the changes in drug development that you you have seen since the start of the pandemic, kind of through 2020? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I mean, just to to re recap the things that that uh, I, I think everybody in this audience knows, mm -hmm. there's been a number of uh, authorized and approved approved vaccines that have been uh, approved remarkably quickly, uh, and uh, I think the you know there uh, in addition to the ones that that we we know about. Uh, the mRNA vaccines and, and the other vaccines coming out from U.S. and European companies. There's a number of others that have been approved in in rest of world. So I think the the list is up to you know eight or eight or nine at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, you, you know I don't want to list the names, but maybe if we just think about how this was able to happen. So typically, uh, uh, we know that the standard development process for vaccines is quite lengthy uh, with quite a lot of checks and balances that uh, many you know thousands of people need to be tested to make sure that that uh, that these these products uh, meet the favorable uh, benefit to risk ratio mm -hmm. um, what happened uh, very very quickly you know maybe not quickly enough according to some people but what happened very quickly was that regulators uh, and governments, made funding available as well as private companies made made funding available uh, to uh, allow companies to go forward um, and manufacture and develop platforms essentially at risk uh, hmm. and to jumpstart uh, some of these phases uh, uh, leapfrog some of these phases to, to go forward um, uh, simultaneously the fda allowed for fast tracking certain types of research uh, allowing for overlapping phases, remote monitoring, uh, decentralized trials, we should, which we should talk about. Uh, the protocols were kept very, very simple, uh, really just testing what, what was necessary. And, and that's not to say that things were left out. There had been, uh, there's been a long uh, cry from regulators that uh, um, protocols should be defined, uh, designed more efficiently just to get to the results. And, and this, that, that forced the industry to respond. 
Um, and there's been the uh, appropriate use of uh, EUAs, emergency use authorizations, mm -hmm. uh, which essentially allowed for dynamic control and dynamic reading of data, uh, especially from placebo groups as they were coming in. So uh, we're not done. Uh, and there's a many more uh, uh, vaccines that are in development, as well as other t classes of drugs, uh, such as antibodies and antivirals that, that are in, developed, in development. But, but I do think that we should be, um, well, I'll just tell you my reaction. Frankly, I'm impressed mm. that the pharma, uh, biopharma industry, global biopharma industry, teamed with regulators uh, on a global basis to provide uh, the, these, these critical and, and necessary uh, emergency developments. So, so I would, I would put that, you know, let me just pause there. I would put that sort of in the, in the immediate impact of, of uh, drug development in, in, in the era of COVID. Mm. Yeah. So you mentioned decentralized trials there. Um, obviously, something that's uh, COVID has kind of forced the, um, I guess, the implementation and the adoption of um, to a large extent. Um, before we kind of delve a little bit more into that, um, just to start, what is exactly the difference between decentralized trials, virtual trials, and synthetic control arms? Yeah, excellent question. So, so this term has been used. Uh, these terms have been used much more frequently recently, and they're concepts that have been uh, circulating and in development in, in, in the industry for, for quite a number of years, you know, at least a decade now. Um, and I think it's important to uh, at least have some awareness of the, the difference in definition. So, mm -hmm. so uh, a synthetic uh, control arm is really an element of a trial where instead of a placebo group, data is used. So ideally, uh, 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 in some situations, uh, no patients need to be enrolled in in a in a placebo group, but just their historic data is used. So, you know, uh, one might think of it a little bit on um, uh, one might think of it a little bit on, you know, kind of a, a registry on steroids almost. Um, uh, virtual trials. Uh, so, so there's a sometimes virtual trials and decentralized trials are sort of used uh, um, interchangeably. Uh, I'll just stick with the FDA definition. So a decentralized clinical trial has substantial elements which are taken out of the central control or, or the central location of patients going into a central clinical site, such as a hospital. And so it's decentralized, meaning that patients can participate in clinical trials from their home. Um, so, you know, the other term is mobile trials. Uh, that's used or electronic trials, but it's basically uh, uh, patients can participate in clinical trials for some or all uh, in in the comfort of their own home or or not going into the hospital. Uh, and the difference there is whether it's considered a fully decentralized trial, where in some cases patients never have to show up at a healthcare facility and and everything goes home, such as you know drugs, and they can participate using electronic platforms, the web, mobile phones, or uh, or this can be called hybrid trials, where there's going to be a number of study visits, and some of the visits uh, take place in a hospital or a central facility. And, and some are decentralized and, and allow the patient to, to stay home. Um, you know, the other terminology here is virtual trials. Again, strictly speaking, a virtual trial is more like a registry. Uh, and, and really, it, you know, the, there's a, a, an old term called in silico trials. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, from a regulatory point of view, that uh, a virtual trial means that, you know, essentially it's a, it, it's a data-based trial. Uh, but so so we prefer to use the the, the terminology decentralized uh, mm -hmm. clinical trials, and and this is a um, there are some really critical benefits here, uh, and and that were were discussed again you know had been discussed for decades, yet the 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 need uh, to to use this kind of approach was greatly amplified in in the past year with with the COVID health crisis. Right. Yeah. You so you say there's a lot of benefits, but what is the FDA and kind of regulatory position on decentralized trials at the moment? Well, it, it's fascinating. So so the FDA and regulators are actually uh, quite enthusiastic and quite welcoming to to work with sponsors 
and and to uh, um, uh, you know to develop new protocols, to develop new endpoints, uh, and you know they they certainly want to continue to make sure that there's rigor and and scientific merit in developing these, these clinical trials. But um, uh, the the FDA, as an example, has had uh, a uh, senior level professionals dedicated to decentralized clinical trials. Uh, we've worked closely with them. Uh, uh, they they have uh, been very uh, uh, responded very rapidly and very positively with comments in terms of developing protocols. Um, uh, and, and in no case do I get the sense that they're relaxing their standards, but I do get the very strong strong sense that they're very enthusiastic about innovation and flexibility in terms of, of developing uh, better, more rapid ways of, of developing drugs. Um, and and uh, this, this has been, you know, this has been applied to all phases of drug development, um, you know, in, in including uh, drug approval trials in phase two and phase three. Uh, obviously, there's going to be more hybrid trials than fully decentralized trials, but there are precedents for fully decentralized FDA um, uh, 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 approved drug approval trials that have been that have been approved by the agency to uh, uh, to conduct the trials, at least to conduct the trials. Mm -hmm. So so we're very, very enthusiastic that this really, you know, indicates a, a new era of uh, more efficient drug development that, that has a number of benefits, both for sponsors as well as for patients. Mm. And um, I say you are a sponsor. Um, you're looking for someone to partner with um, for decentralized trials. What should sponsors be looking for in, in a partner? I, you know, it's a great question. So so I think there's a number of things. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, on, on, uh, Let's put it in several categories. So, so on one hand, um, experience is important, and that experience really uh, should probably be thought of in a couple uh, different domains. Um, it's important to have traditional drug development experience, uh, and uh, uh, just to understand what what some of the rigors are involved, creating databases, uh, safety monitoring. So that really comes from the traditional infrastructure of, of developing of a long, long-standing experience in clinical trials. The other piece of the experience category is experience specifically in decentralized trials because, you know, it's the same, but it's different. And it's different mm. in certain ways, particularly around uh, enrolling patients, uh, uh, understanding what endpoints are are most effective in decentralized trials, uh, working with regulators and and being able to engage with regulators in, in in appropriate ways. So so I would say one big category is is experience, which is kind of the people part. Uh, I think the other big category would be um, the the resources and the resources. Uh, would again, I would divide that into uh, technology and and uh, um, other. No, let's just call it other types of resources. Mm -hmm. On the technology side, you know, we're talking about a decentralized mobile platform. So so you know, in order to connect with patients, uh, these these mobile platforms really need to be quite robust. And it, it's much more than just an app. They have to be. It has to be HIPAA compliant. It has to be able to connect with uh, databases. Those databases need to be uh, FDA uh, 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 meet the standards of FDA, the F FDA for, uh, uh, for for data uh, to be able to analyze. Um, uh, these platforms need to also uh, be able to be used by investigators, principal investigators, sub investigators, remote investigators, as well as the patients. Of course, the patients. So we, it needs to have excellent user interfaces, and and I think a lot of people who are who are listening start thinking are probably thinking right now about the different type of uh, technologies that they use that accomplish different things. So you know. There's there are uh, uh, there are databases, and then there are systems where that are used inside CROs or or clinical uh, research systems that contain data. Then then there are other systems that interface with principal investigators, and then there's other systems that interface that that patients use 
for scheduling, et cetera. Putting all that into a single unified platform mm -hmm. that works very effectively and efficiently, is HIPAA compliant, uh, and that there's no data leakage is very is very important. So, so obviously that takes a fair amount of investment and, and, and resources. Um, and those are probably a couple of the critical things. I mean, I'll just mention a couple other things in the other categories, such as um, if there's a drug involved, there have to be processes and engaging with vendors in order to deliver the drugs. If there's uh, other uh, types of assessments that need to be made in the home, then, then either visiting nurses or visiting health professionals need to be engaged. Uh, there have to be relationships with uh, uh, local health systems and principal investigators in order to uh, uh, carry these things out. So huh, it's a long list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's a number of things, but, but I, think, I think those are probably the major categories that, that I, would, I would call on. Yeah, I've, and um, so in terms of therapeutic area, do you think that particular areas are better suited for decentralized trials? You know, this is a rapidly evolving area. So um, I, I think I think the answer is yes. Uh, however, I think this is changing. And so um, I think we can list some of the some of the areas, uh, some therapeutic areas that that uh, probably you know, people would say, oh, yeah, well, that's a natural, that's a natural fit, um, such as, say, uh, dermatology, behavioral health. There's been a tremendous amount of development in behavioral health using uh, uh, so-called digital medicine or, or uh, software as a therapeutic. Um, those, those types of developments really do seem like they would fit very uh, uh, comfortably in a in a decentralized process because you know they're already they're already already using software you know mm -hmm. other types of things that uh, one would think of as, as in terms of registries uh, uh, late phase post approval studies uh, would work very well in this category um, uh, as mentioned dermatology and 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 you know other types of uh, you know assessments that can be made. Although there's a, there's a bit of a challenge on on the assessment side for dermatology, but but you know those things that have been proposed. However, this these areas are developing very rapidly. So, um, uh, for example, uh, heart failure is one trial that's ongoing right now, uh, and one would think that that's uh, a uh, an area that would require uh, centralization and and patients to come come in for assessments. On the other hand, uh, uh, you know, mentioning the flexibility of regulator that regulators had, um, in order for a trial like that to proceed, the FDA had to be open to using a clinical endpoint that could be measured remotely. And in this case, it was a uh, patient-defined endpoint uh, of of um, uh, of their their uh, their activity and their behavior. Mm. I mean, the FDA. Uh, 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 approves trials based on the way uh, patients feel, function, and perform, uh, and so so the the they they pivoted and uh, uh, the the regulators uh, were um, uh, 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 approved going forward with a drug treatment trial in a complicated disease and congestive heart failure based on patients patients reports and in a validated instrument so they haven't changed or reduced their standards whatsoever mm -hmm. um, but they did say that uh, that how the patient feels functions and performs um, is is as important as survival uh, which really I, I think is a very patient friendly way to yeah. uh, uh, to 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 approach the uh, uh, to approach this this particular disease that 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 needs more drugs developed so so I think that's you know, it, it, for me, that kind of tells the story of both uh, the field moving rapidly and regulators uh, being uh, uh, open to to think differently without reducing standards, but being in a much more patient friendly way to, to accomplish their mission. Yeah, the hugely um, exciting area. Um, yeah, be, in, be uh, fascinating to see how it develops over this coming year and future years. Well, thank you very much for joining. My pleasure.